Hello, this is a British Psychological Society audio interview. I'm Wendy Barnaby and I'm joined by Chris French, who's Professor of Psychology and Head of the Anomalistic Psychology Research Unit at Goldsmiths, University of London. And Chris, we are going to talk about this anomalistic psychology phenomena, which is an enormous <laughs> mouthful, isn't it, for something we might call perhaps the weird stuff. So <laughs> what sort of weird stuff are you looking into? I do quite often refer to it as the psychology of weird stuff. And it it is pretty much anything weird and wonderful. So um, we're interested in the kind of bizarre experiences that people have, the kind of reports they make relating to things like alien abduction claims, telepathy, precognitive dreaming, near-death experiences, a whole range of different weird and wonderful phenomena. And we have as a working hypothesis the notion that paranormal forces don't actually exist. So the primary focus is, can we explain these experiences in normal psychological terms, if you like? Um, Now, that doesn't mean to say that we take a a hard-line position whereby we say we know that paranormal forces don't exist. And so another strand of our research is that we often do actually directly test paranormal claims. So you are starting out with a sceptical viewpoint, but you are, I suppose, assuming that psychology will be able to explain some of these things or to at least add to our knowledge of psychological processes. I mean, what, for example, could psychology add to claims of alien abduction? It's quite a nice example because there's lots of different types of psychological perspectives that come into it. I mean, I think the bottom line is that we are dealing almost certainly with cases of false memory. So all of the cognitive psychological research into memory and specifically into false memories is very relevant. But very often the road to uh, developing that false memory, if you like, has come about because people have had some kind of weird experience. Typically something called sleep paralysis is very often involved. What is it exactly? What happens when you have a bout of sleep paralysis? It's very common in its most basic form. And in its most basic form, it's when you're half awake and half asleep and you realise that you can't move. And that's something that happens to about 40% of the population, at least once in their lives. Typically just lasts a few seconds and you snap out of it and you're fine. A little bit disconcerting. About one person in 20 experiences a much more vivid form of sleep paralysis, which involves various kinds of hallucinatory experience. So you might see uh, lights moving around the room or dark shadows or even monstrous figures, or you might hear footsteps or mechanical sounds or, or voices, and you might feel as if you're being held or dragged out of the bed. There's also a sense of pressure on the chest, difficulty breathing. You can imagine if you have this, and particularly if you have it on a regular basis, it's understandable that people can be absolutely terrified. And of course, because most people haven't ever heard of such a thing as sleep paralysis, and they don't know there's a scientific literature, and even in broad terms, we do understand what's going on in terms of the disruption to the regular sleep cycle, they may be tempted to go for some kind of paranormal interpretation and then feel they need to seek out someone who can help them to recover the memory for the rest of the experience, because the claim is that the aliens can wipe your memory for the rest of the experience. And then hypnotic induction procedures might be used, hypnotic regression, and there's a kind of widespread belief, a misconception with with many people, that hypnosis is some kind of a, a magical key to unlock hidden or repressed memories. In fact, it provides the perfect context for the formation of false memories. So whether we're talking about alien abduction claims or recovering apparent past life memories in a reincarnation context or ritualized satanic abuse, the chances are that in all those cases we're dealing with false memories. Do you think that many of the practitioners of these arts, in in quotes, are dishonest or do they really believe what they're doing, do you think? My own personal opinion is that the vast majority really do believe what they're doing. It's a small minority who are deliberate frauds, deliberate con artists. But um, in, in the vast majority of cases, whether we're talking about people who claim they have healing powers, people who claim that they can do psychic readings, or even astrologers, tarot card readers, etc., they genuinely believe that what they're doing really does work. We do spend some of our time putting their claims to the test under properly controlled conditions, and invariably they will fail those tests. But I believe that they wouldn't actually submit themselves to the tests if 
they knew they were deliberate con artists because clearly they are not going to pass them. Uh, they usually come into the test very, very confident that they're going to pass it. Uh, we get them to sign a statement in advance saying that it's a fair test, that they, they should be able to pass it, and it's only afterwards when they fail that they decide it wasn't a fair test after all. Double-blind control trials. Has there been anything that has survived or nearly survived or survived enough that you've thought, well, you know, perhaps there might be something in that? I think there is a mistake that some sceptics make to believe that there just isn't any evidence in support of paranormal claims, and that's just not true. And I think the one that probably most parapsychologists would put forward as being the, the, the strongest would be something called the Gansfeld technique, telepathy. The debate is around the quality of the evidence, the replicability of the studies, etc., etc. But all of those things like post hoc analysis, like uh, the file draw problem, not publishing studies that don't produce any significant results, occasional fraud, people giving themselves the benefit of the doubt in terms of the way they analyse the data, and often not with any deliberate intent to, uh, to, to behave in a fraudulent manner. I think all of those factors cumulatively could explain why we, we've got the picture that we have in parapsychology. And do people in different countries have the same sorts of parapsychological beliefs? It's very interesting to look at the difference between different cultures in terms of both geography and, 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 and historically, because what you'll very often find is that there will be a situation where you get very similar core experiences, but the details might differ and certainly the interpretation will differ. And again, sleep paralysis is a really good example of that. So in Newfoundland, they talk about the old hag who comes and sits on the sleeper's chest and suffocates them. In Japan, it's kanashibari, which again is a nocturnal spirit attack. In St. Lucia, it's kokmar, which is the spirits of unbaptized children that crawl onto the sleeper's chest and throttle them. Nice. I mean, back in Europe in the Middle Ages, it was the incubus and the succubus, sex-crazed demons who would come and have their wicked way with you while you slept. But you, you examine the details of these cases, and we're looking at sleep paralysis in, in, all, in, in, in different contexts. It must be a wonderful way to teach students, because, as you say, there are so many hard psychological lessons about method and replicability and all of those things in a, a subject which is fascinating. Well, that's what I really do, and I love teaching as a topic. Um, on the one hand, it's a fantastic way of teaching critical thinking skills, of trying to get across lessons about why some forms of evidence should be given much more weight than other forms of evidence. And on top of that, it covers the wide range from topics which are perhaps in some sense a little bit trivial but highly entertaining, the kind of techniques that con artists use to convince other people that they have psychic powers, right the way through kind of things like um, you know, some real challenges to our conventional scientific view. Because as I said before, some of the evidence from parapsychology is much more challenging than a lot of people, a lot of sceptics actually recognise. And then up to the, the most profound issues you could possibly have. Do we survive bodily death? They don't come much more profound than that. The nature of consciousness. And so you can kind of cover all of these topics in a way that the students will naturally enjoy. I mean, it's the kind of thing that people talk about down at the pub or over uh, dinner parties and so on anyway. But actually, you dig a bit deeper and trying to come up with the answers, the explanations, can often be much more satisfying than just thinking that it's a mystery, it's the unexplained. Very often it's not. Very often we can explain it.